everybody. Thanks for joining us here on this fine Sunday. It's a colorful climbers day, the vine class. I'm uh, Trevor Cameron, our general manager here at Sunnyside. So I had a Nicole, she's in the background. Good morning. We'll, uh, we'll show you a slideshow here and lots of pictures and options for some vines, but this is the, the clingy, crawly, climby class. So we're talking about things that we can train up structures, arbors, walls, trellises, obelisks, art pieces, anything you like. Um, hopefully we'll show you quite a few options for some vines. So I'm gonna start slideshow here. Give me one second. All right, there you go. There's my name in case you already forgot. It is the colorful climbers class. Hopefully you got right class on the right day here. Um, hopefully before we kind of get going here, um, you can kind of ask yourself a few questions as a gardener. It will help you, I think, make a successful choice of what you're choosing to grow as a climber. Um, you know, number one is always sun. You know, how much sun or shade will the plant receive? It's a hard one because sometimes we grow vines up on structures. So that may be in sun where you may be a little shadier at the base, which is fine. But do you have all afternoon sun, what we would call full sun, all day sun? Do you have shade where you really don't get any direct sun? Or do you have that part sun, part shade? You know, most all of our shade choices will do well in full shade or morning sun conditions with afternoon protection Vice versa, if we're looking for something for sun, we want at least afternoon, um, all afternoon sun, um, or all day, either way. Um, or is it evergreen or deciduous? And this is always an easy one to probably answer a whole bunch of questions at the end. You know, a, a, an evergreen vine is, is a very subtropical plant. You know, think down Central America, the equator, all kinds of shows we watch on Discovery. You know, evergreen vine is, is not the hardiest creature here in Western Washington. We do have a couple options, which I will show you, but your options are gonna be extremely limited for evergreen. All kinds of choices for perennial or deciduous vines that just go dormant in the winter, wake right back up come springtime. You know, are you looking for a particular season of interest? You know, some folks want a nice spring bloom to welcome out the new year. Do I want summer bloom? Do I want something more towards fall? Do I like fall color? You know, there's a lot of different seasons of interest that will, again, make you have a, a choice that will work with your own taste in your own garden. You know, what structure are you trying to cover? You know, and this is a huge one because I think a lot of people just come down and blindly purchase a, a climbing vine. They just don't have enough room for that particular variety. So watch your sizes and what you're trying to grow it on. Do you have unlimited fence line? Do you have a small little trellis, a post, you know, anything we can pick out the right right vine for the right place in the yard. You know, ultimately, how much coverage do you need? Are you trying to cover a, a massive area? Let's get something a little more aggressive that will do that. Or am I just trying to cover something small and tidy uh, that I don't need quite as big of a plant for? You know, are you going to prune is a question for you or can you prune it? You know, I'll go through some pruning on most of these uh, that we mentioned, but certainly, um, you know, to keep things contained, we do need to prune. We just have to be careful again, does it, the vine bloom on old wood or does it bloom on new wood? That's going to dictate uh, how we attack the pruning during the season. You know, and finally, you know, for me, I'm always trying to, you know, all flowers are going to going to help uh, attract pollinators to the garden, but in particular, if you're looking for maybe hummingbirds or butterflies, there's certainly some options uh, for that as well. You know, there's a, a huge amount, we'll start with clematis. You know, there's a massive amount of clematis in the world. There's, I think, over 300 species worldwide. There is hundreds and hundreds more uh, cultivars or hybrids that you have to choose from. We carry quite a bit here at Sunnyside, try to get a nice variety of, of colors and sizes and sun and shade in different locations. Um, just a couple general tips. If you're choosing to go the clematis route, you know, always plant a perennial or deciduous type clematis two inches deeper than it's in the pot. You know, the main issue with clematis is clematis wilt and you will protect your crown and honestly ensure that if you do get wilt, it may die to the soil, but I'll still have a healthy a crown underneath the ground that should rejuvenate itself. So always remember, if you buy clematis, it's in the pot, plant it two inches deeper than it was before. Um, you know, look at the tags very carefully. Some will take full sun, 
all of them will do the sun part shade and there are some others that we would do more for full shade. Um, another good rule for clematis is it makes easy sense. They like high, hot tops and cool root systems. Clematis don't like to get baked on the root system in afternoon sun. So we want hot tops, but maybe a little cooler soil around them. We can put rocks on there to absorb some heat, plant a small plant at the base. There's a lot of different ways we can help shade that root system, but that's a, a good tip to keep in mind. You know, the vast majority of our clematis uh, will be deciduous or perennial. Um, which is, isn't the end of the world. We get a long season of bloom out of those. We'll show you here so, some examples in a moment. There are a couple evergreen choices, which you'll, you'll see here as well. Um, you know, for me, at the minimum, I'm gonna, I wanna walk out and feed my clematis vine coming out of winter. So I've got a nice push of growth and, and an early bloom. And then at minimum, go back and do that again early summer. So I get that second push of growth, set some more flower buds on my new growth for the season and continue to bloom mid late summer into fall. So at minimum do those two with the good organic rose and flower type fertilizer. Uh, we have EV stone here, um, or certainly if you're doing the foliar feed with something like seed grow, maybe it's just once a month through the growing season. Um, you know, shut off your food usually by August, but maybe perhaps you really want it to grow a little faster. Maybe you get three feedings on with the granular, or as I mentioned, uh, do a water soluble about once a month. Um, finally, know your pruning group. You know, that's the discussion again about old and new wood bloom. There's clematis or, or classified in group one, two, three, A, B, C, however you want to differentiate it. I've, I've heard it called both ways, but essentially we're always trying to carry group three clematis, which means that I bloom on old wood in the spring and then rebloom in the summer and fall on new wood. So that to me is the easiest the no-brainer. I don't have to worry about pruning and cutting back. I'm always going to have flower. So the majority of ours are uh, group three. Now if we look at some specific choices, uh, Clematis armandii is one of our evergreen ones. There's a picture of one here in spring in bloom. Um, that particular one you can see just a little hint of pink in the flower. That's the apple blossom variety. We would also just have white. They call it snowdrift. So we have two choices on flower color, just a light, light, light pink in the bud, and then we'd have a white flower. They are fragrant. Um, in my opinion, you should grow evergreen clematis like this in part shade or shade. I certainly see some folks get away with it with a little more sun, as long as you're careful with the water and perhaps maybe a little bit of sunburn when we get to late summer, but they're always gonna thrive morning sun, afternoon shade, or a little bit shadier condition. I will keep leaves. They're typically plenty hardy up here, um, but again, maybe a bad winter, we will do a little bit of nipping back on some of the wood. We do a little pruning and then off we go for springtime again. So give this one some room. You know, this is one uh, that will cover up some area if you wanted to. It's certainly easy to control by pruning as well. Um, but this one, if I did want to prune it properly, I would always let it bloom in spring, then cut it back so that I can grow all summer have some old wood to set the flower buds again for the next spring. The other evergreen one is avalanche. It's got a little more dissected foliage. It's a little less aggressive, a little smaller grower. I think they're wonderful in containers, little small trellised areas, even on a little obelisk or a tripod in the garden. Very heavy white spring flower. That's another early spring bloomer, but I will still have uh, some foliage left during the course of the season. A uh, couple of species clematis uh, that we some get some in off and on. Um, clematis alpina or alpina, that's our alpine clematis, extremely hardy. This is always a, a spring bloomer. I get those kind of nodding violet blue flowers on it, real pretty in flower. Um, this is one you would have to choose the species or you'll find a few different cultivars around as well. If you wanna change your flower uh, size and the color slightly, uh, there are some uh, some options. If I was gonna prune this one, uh, this is one again, uh, maybe right when it's leafing out, you know, in that maybe March time, it usually leaves out pretty early. I can look at what is breaking bud and go in and get rid of maybe some of the dead wood at that point, and then off we go. It is just a spring bloomer. So I can also go back after flowering, do a little cutting back and still have the summer for it to rejuvenate and give me some old wood for flowering the next season. Clematis tang tang tanguitica, I always called it the orange peel clematis. 
Um, it's another one that's got an interesting flower, a little bit longer season of bloom on these. I would have the majority of the summer. I chose this picture intentionally because I wanted you to see the seed heads as well. A lot of the clematis that we talk about, and in particular, some of these species, very attractive seed heads. So even though the flower has gone, I've still got some interest on my climber uh, during the course of the season. So orange peel, you can see kind of that golden yellow, again, nodding flower. Um, it's an easy one to grow. This is one we could cut back again at the end of the winter to kind of control the size. Um, if I leave more wood, the earlier it will flower. The harder I cut it back, I'll just wait a little bit longer into the summer before it blooms. So that, that's your choice on pruning. Uh, clematis turnifolia. This is our sweet autumn clematis. So this is one you'll find probably a little more in the summer uh, at a place like Sunnyside to plant. But this is a very heavy bloomer in that August, September time frame. Great fragrance. It's a huge plant. This is one you'd want to give some room to grow. Um, it does maybe reseed just a little bit too. Um, so keep that in mind. But certainly if I've got a large area, a structure, um, a really pretty clematis, if you want to fill in that kind of late summer, early fall time frame with a real pretty white flower. Uh, clematis montana is the, is the last species here for springtime. I found that's a great picture where you can kind of see it sprawling out on a large fence with some trellis attachments. Um, very impressive in flower. This is one of the, the spring bloomers that will give you a lot of flower power. We can do whites, we can do pinks, we can do darker pinks. Some of them even have a little bit of fragrance. Um, and the other bonus with this one, again, very hardy. This is one that we'd find out in mountain re regions um, and great fall color. This is one we would look at bloom and spring nice clean growth in the summer and then turning some nice reds, burgundies, uh, some colors on the leaves before they drop in the fall. If we get into some of the hybrid type clematis, um, you know, I'm gonna mention a few groups here and then we'll show you some of kind of the old tried and trues. The Vancouver series to me is the superior new clematis. So there's more and more coming down here into the States. We're not too far south of UBC up there in Vancouver so we can borrow some here in Washington. Uh, but these are great Northwest growers. They've done some breeding, made it a little tidier. I think you'll find with these some good color options, but as well size, not quite as big, maybe as typical hybrid clematis. Some ones that we can, again, pick our color and maybe keep it in a little smaller area. Starry Nights has got the, the beautiful base color there with the bars on it. Fragrant Star, just like it says, it does smell a little bit. It's a nice white. That one's a great one if we have a little more shade on it, that'll kind of brighten up a shady area. We've got Danielle if I wanna have something in the dark purple range. And then Mystic Gem is the new one this year with again, the white base color and that really nice light pink bar on it. Um, very intricate stamens. You can see the flowers are showy. Um, that's why they call Clematis the queen of the vines. This will be your prettier flowering option uh, for most of the year. So check out those Vancouver series. We've got them all in now here in stock um, and certainly some options I can utilize that maybe keep me down more in that six to eight foot range and not have something that gets uh, too awful big. The Boulevard is the other one that we really promote around here. Uh, we're able to access these plants through Monrovia growers. They've got a wonderful assortment of different colors available. We have a number of them in already right now. Uh, essentially, these were bred in, in Wormsey, England, again, for smaller structure and extremely heavy flowering. So to me, these are some of the best choices for growing in containers. If I want something smaller that I can keep in a small pot and have on a, on a, on a reasonable size trellis or again, obelisk or art piece, a great choice is any of the Boulevard series, again, or a smaller spot in the garden. Most of these were going to be in that four to six foot tall range and not really get much bigger than that. So you can see a few color options here. We've got Polly, you can see blue there, Olympia, Sarah Elizabeth, a great newer pink one. Samaritan Joe's got a beautiful little kind of lilac purple edge on white. And you in there is another new one we have in this year with kind of, again, that, that dual color with the bar and, and the base color on the flower. So all great growers, there'll be other colors in as well, but that'll kind of give you a feel for if you're looking for a little smaller scale with maximum flower. These are ones again that will repeat flowering May, June, and then all the way through mid, late summer into fall. Uh, if we get into some of the old tried and true ones that we try to keep around here every year at Sunnyside, 
Uh, Nelly Mosier, you know, is still an unbeatable one. If you like that light pink with the, the contrast again on the bars, that's a great grower. We, we tend to always keep some Nellies around. Again, that sun to, to part shade area is ideal. Although again, if we're careful on the water, we can do Nelly in full sun as well. Uh, Multi Blue is one of my favorites. If you like the blue with kind of the double center in it, you'll find a, a, a double one like Multi Blue a lot of times will bloom with single blue flowers in May, June. Then when we get that bloom coming out in summer, we'll start to get the full double flower. So kind of to me, a nice mix of flower styles, but also a great blue color. That, that's our go-to blue. A candida is a great example of pure white. You know, sometimes white's a great one for shade. If you have a shadier spot, Henry Eye, Toki, we get quite a few different whites in. But if you're trying to brighten up a shade area, you know, again, a white, white blooming vine does a great job at that. So don't forget about the pure white ones as well. Uh, some good whiny red ruby colored ones like Ernest Markham. That's another great old fashioned one that will get a little bit bigger, but give you a really hot summer bloom. Jackman Eye is the all time most popular purple. We get probably more calls and requests for that than any. Um, still a, a bigger grower, but if I want to cover some space and have a nice dark purple flower, that would be a great choice. Uh, Killian Don Donahue is, an, is another one that's kind of caught our eye the last few years. A great flower there. You can see with the two-tone, we've got some fabulous plants of those in right now. Niobe, if I want to go a little bit darker, like that ruby red color, um, nice again, repeat flowering over the summer and a great one for sun uh, with the red flower. And then Ramona is another kind of light blue periwinkle color little bit larger flower maybe than some of the others um, if I want a big old single one that's that's got a great bloom on it as well. So some great clematis there you know again this is always recorded we, we tend to go pretty fast but you're more than welcome to go back and, and take some notes and check out some of those names as well. Uh, honeysuckles is up next if you follow the sheet hopefully everybody's uh, got a copy of the sheet I try to keep myself organized so that that's the next one we'll talk about here is honeysuckles. You know, we do have some in now and we'll continue to have more honeysuckles come in here through spring and early summer, but it's a great one if I want that late spring to midsummer type flower. A lot of times I can go whites, yellows, oranges, reds, coral, lots of options for different styles of honeysuckle. Many of them have great fragrance as well. If you read your tags or when you choose your variety, if fragrance is a good one for you, absolutely look for those. It's, a, it's an awesome vine for attracting hummingbirds. You see the pictures here coming up. You'll see those perfect trumpet tube flowers for hum hummingbirds to, to tuck their little beaks in and, and grab some nectar on. So we've got, got some options for hummingbirds and always good pollinators. Um, you know, I swear by honeysuckle and sun. Um, you can do part shade if you like, but I, I would for sure try to give your honeysuckle as much sun as you can. It'll help keep the foliage clean and give you maximum flower. Uh, these are all deciduous. We do get an evergreen honeysuckle in once in a while. I don't think it blooms quite as heavy as the deciduous ones. It would give you a little bit of leaves, uh, leave in the, in the winter as well. If you want to wait for those, we will have them in a little later. Um, but if, if I'm going to prune a deciduous one, again, always a good rule with pruning is prune after bloom. If I go out in the winter and I destroy my honeysuckle, I'm going to sacrifice uh, quite a bit of my flowering that season. If I wait for it to bloom and then give it a heavy prune, I've got the summer to fall for it to regrow, set flower buds, and I've got maximum flower again the next season. You can always go out in the winter and tell it to behave, tidy it up a little bit, cut some branches that maybe have flopped out underneath an arbor, maybe it's on a walkway, wherever you have it. I can certainly tidy it up in the winter, but if I'm going to do a, a major pruning, I would prefer you did it right after flowering. Um, and to be always honest, you know, watch the mildew a little bit on honeysuckles. The more shade you have, the more prone you're going to be to a little bit of powdery mildew. So just uh, something to keep in mind. More sun, the better luck you're going to have. If I do have it in some shade, watch the foliage in spring. So we can use neem oil, something very natural, and, and not have to get the mildew going. If we look at a couple of options, we've got... Uh, Hall's honeysuckle, that's a great Japanese variety. I'm going to have the white yellow flower on that, but great fragrance. So that's one, if we're going for smell, that's got a, probably the highest of the fragrance on, on the Hall's type honeysuckle. 
also makes a great ground cover. A lot of parts of the country and some gardeners even up here use it as kind of a sprawling ground cover. It does well like that as well. Uh, gold flame is the one we typically have around. Same again, a little, a little bit of fragrance, not quite as heavy as the halls, but I've got a much, much hotter color. So if I like that yellow with the pink, maybe a little more attractive to the hummingbirds as well, gold flame may be one uh, for you to take a peek at. If I want to get into the hot colors, I'm going to go more for the trumpet style honeysuckles. Major Wheeler is one we get around. If I want to kind of mix that, that corally orangey color, we'll have those here pretty quick. And then something again with bright orange like Mandarin. We've had this in once, but we will get some more of those. But you can see again with that large trumpet flower, very attractive to the hummingbirds, the pollinators. I don't get as much fragrance out of these colors, but you will get a, a really nice flower display in the summertime. Now, if we start to dive into maybe some more obscure vines or some ones that you you you, you, see, you don't maybe don't see around quite a bit, uh, kiwi is one of the favorites here at the nursery. We've got a big specimen growing on our grounds. You can take a look at, uh, but we we would call this the chocolate vine. I don't know why it's called chocolate vine, but that's just always what it's had. It, it doesn't look like chocolate or taste like chocolate, but uh, but it is a nice spring bloomer. This is one we like the white variety called Shirobana. This is one that I'd have fragrance on uh, in the spring when it's in bloom. They're still flowering a little bit right now. They started a, a month or so ago, um, but this would be the best foliage one. Akibia, you know, 99% of the time is going to keep the majority of its leaves in the winter. So this is a great choice if I'm going to cover up a large area in sun or shade, honestly, something I will get some spring flower on, but I do have some foliage on uh, through the winter months as well. Uh, this one you will get a fruit on as it gets older. It's kind of an added bonus to me in the in the summertime to fall. We would have a cool fruit that develops uh, when we get a little bit older plants. And again, if, if I want to prune my akibia back, we do ours at least once or twice a year here. We want to prune it after it's done flowering once and then maybe check it in late summer, fall to see how much it's grown. Um, you know, living here with one for about 10 years, I can tell you Mr. Akibia might grow about six or eight feet in one season. So this will cover up some area um, and give you a little bit more instant gratification. Uh, Wisteria, you know, I think most people probably recognize that name, probably one of the more impressive flowering uh, vines. We've got some great plants in right now. We just shipped a whole bunch of them here because they're about to bloom. Uh, this is one I would have huge hanging clusters of fragrant flowers here as we get into May, June, maybe a little bit of bloom off and on as, as they kind of drop a flower in later summer. But the majority of our bloom is going to be here in that May, June time frame, and we will have great fragrance. We can do whites, pinks, lavenders, blues. There's some lots of options. Um, wisteria is a monster plant. I'm going to smile when I tell you Pick very carefully where you're going to plant your wisteria. I don't know that I'd want this climbing on my house. You know, a very heavy structure, preferably four by four posts to hold the weight and somewhere we can keep it on and let it do its thing. Because a, a growing wisteria that you've allowed to cover some area is going to be probably the most impressive plant and flower. We just got to make sure that we give it enough room uh, to, to do its thing. So get 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 an area picked out and and, and so on and, and and let it go lots of support like i mentioned there um again if i'm going to prune wisteria after flowering i can do a little bit of tidying and then i would go back in the winter and i would cut the majority of that real wispy thin wood out i just need the old bud sections that that will drop the flowers for me the next year so we can cut it back quite a bit to control the size um, most people on vines, I think, are a little harder to get up in the air and do that sort of thing. We can certainly let it go if you've got the room, but if you want to uh, keep it a little tidier, we would go in and prune after bloom and then also do a little bit in the winter to get some of that wispy wood removed. We've got Japanese varieties, we've got Chinese varieties, as well as American wisteria. Um, the bigger flowers are going to be on the Chinese um, and the Japanese style wisteria, American ones still have great fragrance. They're great bloomers, a little bit shorter, maybe a little longer blooming time frame if you want to check some of those out. But certainly most of the wisteria you see around is, is going to be either Japanese or Chinese. Um, there's really no, someone's inevitably going to ask at the end, what about wisteria trees? 
you know, there's not really a difference in the plan. It's the same exact thing. It's on what you want to do with it. If you came down and saw our wisteria plants, you would see a very clean structure with old wood and a massive amount of flower the first year. If I keep pruning it and keep those, those shoots off the trunk, there's my tree. You know, I can train it into whatever I want to. If you want to let it grow up on a structure, then let, let it do its vine thing. But it is the same plant. It's just how on how it's trained as the gardener. So here's a few pictures just to kind of show you. Uh, Kuchibani is a Japanese one. If I want white flower mainly with just a little hint of purple on the tip, uh, we've got some of those around. Uh, Lawrence is a good variety. You can see kind of more towards the bluey lavender color. Longissima alba is one we've had at the nursery here. Um, a big old long white bloomer. Again, heavy fragrance. Um, and a massive flower on that one. The Japanese would call that Shiro Noda. Uh, pink Ice is gaining popularity. A lot of pink lovers out there. And the, the Hone Benny or Pink Ice would be another great Japanese variety with the long flower clusters and a nice pink color. If we want to get towards purple, Royal Purple is one that we have in right now. We get some other odds and ends of purple varieties, but Royal Purple is as good as any. And then if you really want to get something fun, we do have a few of the double purple ones. They, they call that Violacea plena. We do have a few of those around this year. Again, if I want that massive flower cluster, but you can see by that picture, same long cluster, but those individual flowers have the double petals. It's kind of unique. Now, again, some little bit different vines. The Hobelia, uh, Mr. Hinckley has been kind enough to, to introduce a few varieties of these to the Pacific Northwest over the years. Um, this is another kind of fun one that would be evergreen. I want to make sure this is clear. It's another good evergreen choice, but I really want to have shade with this. I can have full shade or morning sun. I don't want any afternoon on the Hobelias. So you've got a couple different choices around. Um, this is a picture of one called Cathedral Gem. Uh, we do get one other variety of this, but I'm always going to have kind of that white to creamy flower, great smell and fragrance on them when they bloom in that early to mid spring time frame, but I'll still have my foliage through the rest of the year. Uh, this is a plant some folks called sausage vine. If you look it up after class, it does get a really cool, looks like a little sausage fruit on it. Again, that adds to me a little bit of interest when it hangs on there after flowering in that summer fall period as well. Um, get a little bit older plants um, and you will start to see the fruit on it. And another one, again, being evergreen, I want to leave these guys alone in that late summer, fall, winter time frame. I want to let my Hobelia bloom and then immediately do a little bit of pruning if I want to to control the size. Then I let it go the rest of the summer to produce that, again, that old wood that gives me the flowering the next spring. Uh, climbing hydrangeas, you know, these are the We'll call them the American ones, a, a couple of different choices. Uh, Hydrangea, Anomala, Petiolaris is our green variety. Um, I picked these two pictures intentionally because now we kind of get into some vines that will adhere themselves to structures. So you can see on the left there, the green climbing hydrangea, the Petiolaris. I turned yellow in the fall. I've got a white lace cap flower. But what's that growing on? You can see in that picture that is right on concrete. I don't have that on a trellis. I don't have it on a, a post. If I plant it in the right spot and those, those branches find brick, concrete, wood, any kind of structure, they will actually root right into that to support themselves. So this is one, again, the brick to concrete, we don't mind maybe letting it attach to. I don't know if I'd want it on my, the siding of my house. Um, but certainly on trellises, post, arbor structure, uh, anywhere you want to cover, climbing hydrangea is one that will really find its own way and start to grow up. So again, these both are deciduous. We won't have any leaves in the winter, but I've always got white lace cap flower, and I've got a really cool bark on these. These are one that kind of peel and fissure on the bark. So even the winter time, uh, to me, they look pretty cool. Uh, Firefly or Miranda, is I have this in my own house that I keep away from my siding and on a really cool trellis uh, in my back garden. That's one I'll have the cool foliage with. So if you like variegation, you like that contrast of the yellow lime color with the dark green center, same white flower, but this is another one we could utilize uh, more on a shady situation. I wouldn't give the, the variegated one full afternoon sun, 
the, the hydrangea, the, the, the green version, we could really plant anywhere as long as we're careful with watering it. That one we can have in, in full sun as well. Okay, so there's a great example of, again, a vine that I'm gonna root right into a structure and not necessarily vine around or have to tie it up. A couple evergreen climbing hydrangeas. Again, both these will prefer a little bit more shady location little bit of late day sun is fine, morning sun's okay, but I don't want that all day sun. Uh, they'll get a little tired in the summer. Uh, we've got a, a Steve, the, the owner here, has got a great hydrangea samani I planted on one of his big flowering cherries out in the front garden. You can come down and take a look at it, but planted at the base again, it rooted right into the trunk and had continues to climb up into the tree. So yes, the cherry tree is fine. It blooms every year. It looks great. But now you've got that added interest of kind of the tropical jungle, you know, something kind of fun climbing up into the tree like we might see down towards the equator. White flower, and I would still keep my leaves in the winter. Integrifolia, we should have a few a little bit later in the summer this year, but just an, again, another evergreen option, a little bit narrower leaf um, on that, same white lace cap flower, same kind of growing conditions. If we look at some Japanese climbing hydrangeas, you know, this one's always kind of a fun one to one, fun one to say. They call these schizofragments. Sounds like a nervous disorder, but that's the the plant we're talking about. Schizofragma hydrangeoides. That's a tongue, a mouthful right there. So there's some great varieties around. Again, this is a plant that we have growing here at the nursery. You can come down and look um, on some of our shady fences. But again, another one that will root right into wood or structures pretty manageable in size, a little bit slower growing. I chose to show you you folks these two because I think, again, they all have a nice lace cap flower. We can do white or pink, but these maybe have a little bit more foliage interest. They're both deciduous. They'll turn color in the fall, but during the growing season, on one like Moonlight, you can see there climbing on a chimney right into the brick. That would give me a really nice variegated leaf with that white with the green, so a nice contrast in the shade garden. Red Rhapsody, you can see by the new foliage, is gonna give me a little bit of red, which is an un unusual color for shade. I would have that in the spring to early summer, and then again, have a nice green leaf uh, during the summer and the fall season. Climbing roses, you know, this is one we're talking about, all things that creep, climb, and cling. Uh, we can't forget about climbing roses too. You know, it doesn't change the fact if you came you know, to me at the nursery and said, I want a climbing plant, I got full sun, I want flowers all summer and I want fragrance. There you go, the climbing rose. You know, that's the one thing we're gonna have reliable uh, bloom on if we deadhead a bit all summer through the fall. Lots of options for colors. Um, we're getting down on selection here. Roses have been popular again this season, but we do still have some climbers. We always have a great fresh crop every January if there's a particular color you're looking for. These aren't old rambling roses. They're not old fashioned climbers that we get that one big flower display and then nothing the rest of the summer. These are all modern climbing roses is what I would call them. Ones that we would get repeat flowering as long as we deadhead and keep them fed every month, four, six weeks in the summer. We'll have great color and great fragrance on climbing roses. Fourth of July, you can see it looks just like it is. A big firework display with red well, white stripes on red flowers and a little bit of yellow in the middle. Joseph's coat, if there's an example, if you like the, the hotter colors, maybe towards the yellow, the oranges, the apricots, that one's got a nice blend of colors as well. Pretty in pink Eden, maybe your traditional, want that classic, you know, English fragrant rose look on a nice pink. Can't be pretty in pink Eden. That's another great pink option. The new one this year we tried is Golden Opportunity. I think it's a little different yellow, kind of more towards that golden yellow or, or orange yellow color. It's not quite so light, but again, a nice big classic rose flower, great for sun, and we'll have some good smell as well. Now, before I move to the next, we'll say with the roses, you know, we've always kind of thrown in a little bit of pruning here for the vine class today. You know, a climbing rose is going to be a little slower and steady, and I'm not going to I'm gonna wait a few years for it to climb up and get over my arch or my trellis or whatever you're growing it on. I'm not gonna to wanna to walk out and cut climbing roses back severely in the, in the winter. You're more than welcome to, it won't hurt the plant. <clears throat> but the whole point of growing it is I want it to cover something. So if I leave those alone, 
a little bit on pruning and just tidy them up in the winter. Maybe a branch going somewhere I don't want, a little bit of deadheading, some structure, then you're good to go. We don't have to cut these far down like we do with typical uh, shrub roses in our yard. You know, passion vine. I think there was three more emails this morning I cleared at 7 a.m. looking for passion vine. Um, you know, blue crown um, is the variety I'm showing here in the flower. Very, very cool uh, flowering vine. Um, they are hard to come by. We do have a bunch of them reserved. I'm hoping they'll be here at some point, a little later, mid, late May. Um, but this is a really cool vine if you're into, into something fun. They're not evergreen up here. They're deciduous. You need to give them all the heat you can, go drainage, feed them regularly uh, to have success. Um, you know, and this is one, if we get a cold winter, you know, it may nip a passion vine down to the ground, but typically they'll start over as a perennial. So cite this one where you're going to get as much heat as you can. It's a really showstopper flower, but one we would see bloom here in Western Washington, more like mid, late summer into early fall when we have a little bit warmer temperatures. So that's one uh, to keep an eye on. There's lots of passion vine varieties you'll see online, you'll hear about, you'll read about. There's not many hardy ones. There's a lot of tropical passion vines that would make great annual vines to grow. Um, but Blue Crown to me is the one that you'll have the, the best reliable hardiness out of. A star jasmine, you know, with global warming, I feel a little more comfortable talking about star jasmine as a vine option. Um, you know, again, we get a brutal winter, the star jasmine is going to get nipped back a little bit, but I see a lot of them now around my neighborhood, growing, driving all over uh, different communities in Western Washington. You see these more and more. If you can find that spot where we get really good hot south sun, we want heat for these, you know, a brick wall, you know, somewhere that's facing south. We don't want to tuck these in shade. We want sun and heat, and we will have a pretty good success with growing these. This is one we would stay evergreen, so we would have leaves in the winter, and we would have those little star white fragrant flowers. A lot of times in nurseries, you'll see them blooming here in May. Coming back next year would be more in the heat of the summer in your in your own yard. So more like a late June, July into August kind of thing. If you keep them fed, they will they'll they'll reflower a little bit as we go through the summer. Um, but just make sure they're in a good hot spot. And maybe even in a container, you know, if you're worried about hardiness, um, you know, it's a great one we could grow in a nice pot, have out on the deck in the season, leave it out in the winter, and then we do see some night temperatures coming, low 20s in the teens. Sweet, we can take that container, maybe throw it in the garage for a couple nights or up against the house to give it a little bit of protection. You know, trumpet vine um, is always one I hesitate to put on here, but again, with the nicer summers we've been having. Um, I actually see a lot of these bloom now in summer. This is one I'd be down in Oregon and I'd see them everywhere because they're just a little bit warmer down there. Up here in Washington, you're starting to see these flower, I think a little bit more regularly. Trumpet vine is a huge plant. No, I don't want to lie to you. This is not one I'm going to probably put on a little six foot trellis by my front door. You know, this is one I could grow out, you know, 50, 60, 80 feet along a long split rail fence in the sunshine or a long fence line or a large arbor, have those beautiful hot colored trumpet flowers, a great one for hummingbirds. Um, no fragrance really, but really good flower power on campsus or, or trumpet vine. Orange, red, or yellow, those are your choices. They're always gonna be deciduous. So we would turn a little color in fall, drop our leaves and then relief out in springtime. They're plenty hardy, they just tend to be pretty aggressive. So just be careful where you cite them and give them plenty of room uh, to grow and mature for you. Uh, Boston Ivies. You know, we can't forget about some foliage options here too, but Boston Ivies um, are certainly things that we would go dormant in the winter, but get very attractive fall color from. So think, you know, maybe back east. If you've been back east at all, you know, think Ivy League schools. That's what it is. If you look at those old brick buildings, they're gonna use Boston Ivies to grow straight on brick, concrete, wood, different structures like we talked about with hydrangeas. Um, it's kind of fascinating back there, they found if I cover my wall with something like Boston Ivy, A, I cool my house down and B, um, I keep a little bit warm in the winter time too because I've got a little more insulation on there. So um, certainly not something I'd worry about here where, where we're located, uh, but an option if you want, again, a nice seasonal vine it's got great foliage, does a great job of coverage. 
or even as a ground cover, but I get some spectacular fall colors out of. You know, we talked vines, you know, we can't have a, a, a climby, clingy class without talking about some edible ones too. We've talked about these at a couple other classes so far this spring, but don't forget about grapes and kiwis. You know, we've got uh, a couple of great fuzzy kiwis here on a nice arbor structure here on our property we can show you, but certainly things that we can grow that we can also eat. You know, if you've got good sunshine um, and you've got some room to grow, kiwi vines make fabulous additions. You know, we were always stuck with buy a he, buy a she, plant two, let them do their thing. You've got some self-fertile options now where I can just have a nice sunny post, an arbor, some sort of structure to plant one plant, let it vine up and do some covering and I'll get some sweet, uh, delicious fruit out of, out of it down the road as well. So remember Kiwi Magic, you know, is a great hardy kiwi that would be self-fertile um, or there's a newer one called Sweet and Solo that would be a fuzzy kiwi that would be uh, self-fertile. So I don't have to worry about the, the he, she thing anymore. On the grapes, you know, lots of different options. You can get fresh eating grapes, seedless grapes, wine grapes, you know, get what you like to grow as a vine. But again, if I've got a, a fence, an arbor, a structure that I can train grapes on, it makes a fabulous vine. They've got great leaves, really nice fall color. And again, I would have some delicious grapes to, to snack on as we get into that mid late summer into fall time as well. Now, finally, we'll just mention a couple annual vines. Um, and we'll, we, we, have, we have these here at Sunnyside, you know, but, you know, think of an annual, you know, why are you buying an annual? I want flower power, you know, whether we're buying a geranium or something in a hanging basket or, a, you know, a thriller, a filler and a spiller for a container, you know, I want flowers. So think of these annual vines, you know, kind of as a seasonal thing. You know, if I've got a really cool pot, you know, then maybe I put a cool obelisk in and I want to plant something annual that's going to bloom all the way until we get frost. Maybe I've got a spot by the door, a little post that I want to grow something that, again, will give me color all through the summer, fall. You know, you're not going to beat an annual vine. If we keep these fed regularly with, with something like seed grow, maybe once a month as we go through the season, I'm going to have maximum flower. You know, I come down, the, the first one there, black-eyed Susan vine, you know, loves heat, loves sun. I can get orange, yellow, red, some different pinks even, different colors that's going to bloom its little heart out all the way through the summer up here where we're at. You know, if I feed that regularly once a month and give it good sunshine, I could buy a little four-inch plant right now, pop it on a post or a trellis. That thing will grow six feet, you know, in a season. It's going to be an impressive plant you'll be happy with if you just think of it as an annual. Plant it. Enjoy the flowers, pitch it in the fall. You can always do another one next year as well. Also hanging baskets, you know, you'll see those in baskets as well, kind of as a viney, you know, trailing plant. Rhodochitin is one uh, that we will, we have some in and we'll have some more coming. If you like a little bit different bloom, you can see in the picture there, that purple to kind of black violet flower, another great annual vine. If I keep that fed, I can do the same exact things. Use it as a cool centerpiece in a container a little annual spot by the door, by the patio for color, um, or in a basket as well. And then finally, Mandevilla. You know, we have our uh, big chunk of these coming up here this next week, so don't come up today or tomorrow, but I think they're doing on Thursday. We'll have whites, reds, pinks, some different options. This is another one, a great tropical vine that's got maximum flower power. We go through quite a bit of Mandevilla here, again, for folks that want to do something cool, in a container or have something in, a, in a, a very visible spot in their landscape to grow on a trellis for a season and have all the flowers that they do. Keep them fed, you know, regularly and you'll have flowers again all the way through the season until we get colder in the fall and we start over with another one next year as well. So we'll have a few of those in again this week. Um, you can, again, containers as a trailer, a vine, or, or as a great hanging basket option as well. Okay. Well, I think we're actually doing pretty we, right on time. We're doing good with time for a change. So let, there's our contact information. You know, if you want to email in, email in some questions, check out our website. We've always got great information on there as well. You've got our email there as well as our website. I'm going to stop sharing here and just tell you about a couple things. So today, again, with the class, like we always do at Sunnyside, we try to, try to give you uh, gardeners a good discount to come down here and do some shopping. So 
if you want to come down, all the vines are on 20% off starting today uh, through this coming Friday. So we, we, we've got a pretty good stock of most everything we talked about. I will warn you if you're interested in the wisteria, get down here this week because they'll probably be gone um, by Mother's Day and that's it for us for the year. We've got a beautiful crop this year, but they're getting harder and harder to come by. Um, and certainly there's some things that, that keep coming in through the season, but we do have a pretty good selection. Shop at the 20% off discount. Next week, May 1st on Saturday um, is the next class with me here. I'll be teaching on roadies and azaleas in the morning, kind of our classic uh, Washington native plant. Uh, we'll have a great discussion on roadies and azaleas at 10 a.m. on Saturday. That's also kind of a special festival day. We've turned rhododendron weekend into a what we call a trust show. So we'll have special guests up here a Saturday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. if you want to stop by the Pilchuck chapter of the American Rhododendron Society comes down, they answer questions, they do a trust show and bring an unbelievable amount of flowers down for you folks to see some really spectacular rhododendrons that maybe you don't see in a lot of yards. They've got great plants down here for sale already to help out their charity and, and their cause. Um, and again, varieties you may not see uh, ever again. I've picked up four or five already, so that should probably tell you something. If you like cool roadies, roadies, make sure you pop down here this week, take a look at what we have in, and then next Saturday uh, for our trust show, okay? So I'm tired of blabbling. I'm gonna, Nicole's gonna turn herself on and let's see what we got for some questions here. Um, you gave us a lot of great options. I'm thinking about where else can I put a vine in my yard? So thanks for that. Always uh, helping enable us to get more plants in our yards. I like it. <laughs> Um, the plant enabler. There you go. Yeah, right. <laughs> so there was a question that came through about evergreen vines, um, and they've got some heavy clay, damp soil. Are they okay in that kind of conditions? Are there things you can add to help the drainage? Well, we, we can always amend our soil to help drainage. You know, compost is always the great equalizer. But, um, you know, if you're going to plant a vine and it's a heavier, wetter soil, especially in the winter, you're going to have to be real careful because I'd hate to have you establish something for a few seasons and then it crashes out because we get too wet. So a massive hole and I would probably mix in a third compost and really try to break up that clay and get some organic matter in there. It will get better, um, but it, it's, it's gonna take a little bit of work on the soil. Um, and we talked about clematis, how they like the, the age old adage of they like the hot heads and the cool feet. So yep. if they're in a spot where their feet aren't cool, what can you add or how do you help amend that so that they can flourish some more? Well, a, a lot of times it's, it's even, it, it, you just don't want that, aft, that sun just baking on the surface of the root. So a lot of times, you know, mulch will help a little bit, but sometimes even getting rocks you know, covering just the right around the crown with some large stones that will absorb the heat and keep that from baking on the soil. A little plant, a little perennial, you know, anything to just keep that afternoon sun on from, from cooking the surface of the soil. So another reason to get another plant, sounds like. There you go. <laughs> Which we all need, I'm sure. Um, we didn't talk at all about hops. Um, yeah. Do you have any, you know, tips on those? Are they fragrant? Yep. Are they good vines to use in your yard? Yeah, you know, hops, um, I'll be honest, I had it on there two days ago, and I thought I'll never make it in 45 minutes. So um, we, we do get beer hops around here. If you're doing some home brewing, uh, that's one where you would actually harvest and use as kind of an edible thing if you called drinking edible I guess it half is but we certainly will have some some western Washington hops in for that the one that I honestly had on was golden hops you know again um, I think a great foliage vine we've got one uh, Steve planted in his garden years ago stop down and look at it it is one crazy creature as it grows about 12 feet in a season but if you've got that again part shade part sun to shade um, a hops vine will go everywhere. So be real careful <laughs> how much hops you want. But if I put that up, I mean, we would cut it to the ground here at the nursery and it would go up eight feet and over six feet in one season, as well as sprawl out across the ground. It does have really sweet golden foliage. So again, I think a really attractive vine if you've got that shady location. Excellent. Um, so we talked a lot about uh, specific to honeysuckles, this question is, but prune after bloom. How do you know how much to prune or, you know, take off? 
Yeah. Well, again, I, I think that's probably a question for you to answer with your situation because, you know, vine's a little bit different than having a class on shrub, tree, whatever. I mean, we know we have this much space to grow our shrub and we can prune it annually to keep it somewhat contained. If I'm buying a vine, you know, the purpose is to cover something. So I'm not interested in, you know, cutting it way back every year, maybe 10 years down the road. Okay, that's enough. And we keep it kind of contained. But I think you would need to answer that how far back, you know, say I've got a little three foot, you know, eight foot tall, you know, arbor and I got honeysuckle growing on both sides and I want it to cover it. Well, I'm not going to, you know, cut it back down every year, but I'm going to go on the sides and say, you know, I want to walk through this still. So let me cut some wood back to keep it contained a little bit. Maybe it's gone off the arbor and gotten a little crazy. Yes, I'll prune that but I'm not going to cut it down hard to the ground. And then I have to start over again. I'm uh, trying to cover my structure. We talked a little bit about the hobelias, the sausage vines. Mm -hmm. Do those do well yeah. in part shade or full shade? F full shade, part shade is the only place to do those. Okay. If we put that out in sun, we're going to struggle in the summer. That's an excellent choice to me for something really cool and different. If you've got zero sun, north side of the house or morning sun only. Um, we've been talking a lot about things that all these vines can climb up and the question came up specifically for clematis because they have the larger um, flowers. Do you need yep. to be mindful of how heavy or large the trellis is when you yeah. plant clematis? Yeah, I mean, you should a little bit. I mean, obviously, you know, with trellises, you know, we got everything from plastic, wood, metal to, you know, any kind of sub substance to, to grow it on. Um, I would always go the wood route myself or something metal because to me that's more permanent. As long as the, you know, most of even the smaller trellises will be half inch wood, as long as it's screwed properly or stapled together, it'll hold a clematis. Um, if we get a bigger grower, yes, maybe we get something more by like one by one wood that's a little little heavier duty. I mean, certainly the the bigger structure you have, the easier it's going to hold up on. But if, if we're talking about clematis specifically, you know, you don't need what's behind me, you know, to grow a clematis on. You know, we just need something, you know, one by one at the most, something metal. Again, the variety you choose is going to tell you. If you've only got, you know, a six, eight foot area to grow it on, let's get a smaller grower. If you have a fence line, let's get a larger grower that will end up trailing out along a, a larger area. And we mentioned that um, seeds are good for containers. Are all clematis okay for containers? Are there only specific varieties? No, I mean, you know, again, we can grow pretty much any plant in a pot that we want to. But if I choose to grow a vine in a pot, I'm not interested in starting over again every three years because it gets root bound. Um, if I've got a nice size container, yes, I could grow any one of them in. I brought up that Boulevard series in particular because, again, most people, I think, that have a container and want to grow a vine, you know, six, you know, maybe eight feet, eight foot is all they need. They're not looking for something that's going to grow 15 or 20 feet. So the, the Boulevard series to me, if I'm looking for maximum flower in a container, you know, on a small trellis, or maybe it's a metal obelisk, you know, something I can pop in the middle, let it grow and do its thing and have maximum flower on a, a little smaller scale. Gotcha. Um, so some of these that, like the trumpet vine we talked about, uh, the campsis, that that can go crazy and get huge. So Not in what do you do if it gets, <laughs> right, right. What do you do if it gets out of control? And now it's, you know, this, um, one of our attendees said it's coming up through their lawn now. Yep. Like what's yep. the best way to control it and kind of keep it where you want it to be? Well, the, the, the issue is, I mean, she said it in a nutshell, is the root system. And if I put campsis in a typical garden, um, and I, it's, it's left unchecked. The roots is the issue. It's going to go everywhere because it's a big plant and it's going to start popping up everywhere. Um, I don't have a magic answer for you for that, except grab the shovel and try to cut those roots down. You'll probably get more of them, to be honest with you. Um, but that's what Campsis does. And that's why I'm always a little leery, like, hey, I've got some property. I've got it. To me, the perfect situation is out on a split rail fence, you know, somewhere in the sun grow 100 feet. I could care less, you know, fill this all up. That's a great spot. Um, I don't think I'd put it close to my house or in a typical garden because of the suckering issue and, and the, the, the invasiveness a little bit. The one thing I'll mention with campsis, um, we will have them in at some points. There's grafted ones now. 
And I think you're going to see more and more of that come through for home gardeners where, you know, say that customer that asked the question is just done with it. I can't handle it coming up in my grass. I got to get rid of this thing and put something else in. If you look for the jazz series, they call it, I'm hoping we'll have some more plants and they've been scarce the last couple of years. Those are grafted in a little bit different, the same flower, the same foliage, nothing changes, but I don't have to worry about the root system. It's a little slower growing and I won't have that invasive root system would be the difference. That's nice. Um, the Akebias, do you need two different varieties in order for them to flower or fruit? Nope, nope, not at all. Yeah, you can do, and again, I showed the white. If you read the test, the, the text as I was whipping through the slideshow, you can also get purple Akebia. Um, I've seen, we've had purple here before. I've carried it over off and on for years. I think it's a little bit more mildew prone in our wet spring. So we choose to pretty much do the white and avoid the purple at, at Sunnyside. I think we've gotten to the end of our questions. Um, if anything pops up, you know, as always, shoot us an email, send us or give us a phone call. We're happy to help. Um, we really appreciate everybody joining us. We hope that you can get out and enjoy the lovely spring weather we've been having. And then we'll see you next weekend for the roadie class. Uh, it's a really fun, great class. Trevor loves them a lot. So um, there's going to be a lot of good information and good varieties. So, <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Hopefully we'll see you next Saturday. Mm -hmm.